from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. I'm Roswell Encina. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you all to the Library of Congress tonight for our very first LC Halloween. So if you haven't seen our new pop-up exhibit, it's really spooky and amazing. So it shows the library's Houdini collection. We have a Day of the Dead collection and all these other ghoulish ghost stories. We'd love you to come back tomorrow and look at it. Um, we started this pop-up um, series earlier this year during the inauguration that we it graduated to a pride exhibit to an awesome con exhibit where we featured the library's largest comic book collection and we decided you know who doesn't love halloween so we decided to do this marvelous exhibit upstairs so it goes until november 1st so we're hoping that you come back to the library bring your friends you know it's the best way to celebrate halloween is here at the library also if you have nothing going on tomorrow afternoon please come back, we're showing Hocus Pocus. It doesn't scream Halloween more without Hocus Pocus, so we would love you to come back. And there are other great events coming to the Library of Congress in the next, in the next couple weeks. We have Christopher Nolan here next week. Um, he's discussing his filmmaking process from Dunkirk to Memento, so we're looking forward to that. And a, and a long list of other great programs coming to the library. So please go to loc.gov for a long list of these programs. And these programs would not be possible without our generous sponsors. So if you enjoy these free events, we encourage you to go to lc.gov slash donate. I know why you're all here tonight. You're not here to listen to me talk about, you know, our housekeeping stuff here at the library. So let's get to it. In 1999, the most successful independent film was released to America. We all thought it was real. We all got scared. It was made with only $60,000, and it generated more than $250 million. So we're very lucky and very fortunate tonight to have some of the filmmakers part of the Blair Witch Project. So please welcome Eduard Eduardo Sanchez, the co-director, Mike Manello, the co-producer, and Julia Myrick, I love her title, she's history fabricator. Please welcome, please welcome them here to the Library of Congress tonight. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. I can't believe it's been almost 20 years. And I have to be honest, when this movie first came out, it, shared, it scared them out of me. I mean, <laughs> the last time I saw it was 1999. I had a rewatch. I rewatched it today. And I have to be honest, I was a little scared to watch it again. Because <laughs> the first time I watched it, I couldn't you know, sleep for the next couple days. So I'm a little nervous what's going to happen to me when I go back tonight. Um, did you ever imagine we'd be talking about this film 20 years later? No, absolutely <laughs> not. I mean, uh, you know, when we uh, did it, we, I mean, we knew we had something cool and we knew that, the, you know, everybody we pitched it to was, you know, got excited and, and it seemed like it was our best idea. But no, I mean, we, we just hoped for, you know, a little video deal maybe and just enough money for the next film. So, and then one, once it blew up, it was kind of like we, Mike and I would, you know, we'd always, we, we, you know, we'd shared an office and uh, we would just come in every day, like a different thing. Like, what, did you see this? And I remember when he came in and brought the, the cover of Time Magazine, the Time Magazine, it was just like, it looked like one of those Time Magazines you do at like Ocean City uh -huh. and you put yourself in the, <laughs> you know, I was like, um, so yeah, I mean, it was complete surprise. And, and, and also just the fact that people are still talking about it is just amazing. You know, um, where did this idea come from? I always wondered like, was, was it based on some other folklore or did you just make this whole which legend up? Yeah, we, uh, we wanted to make this, uh, you know, this uh, fictional uh, mythology of just uh, something in the woods. We didn't know what it was at first. We thought that maybe it was something evil and eventually we were like, well, it kind of has to be witch. That's really the only kind of thing that, you know, from the Salem witch trials, we try to kind of connect those kinds of things. And then we, we let, um, just kind of this, this uh, the support team kind of build the mythology and they went to work and, and uh, Julia can tell you more about that. Um, well, I mean, I think that what you find is, is that you had Dan and Ed who was like, okay, here's our major points, right? Uh -huh. Something happens every 50 years was I think the thing that you came up with. Yeah. Like, we know that this in 1780 and 1820 and now I can't even remember the dates, it's been so long. 
And then Ben came in, my, myself, and Christian Guevara. We were the three kind of history fabricators. And Ben really loved the Bell Witch. He's a super horror maven. And, and I think uh, one of the lucky things of the process was when you love ghost stories, you tell ghost stories the right way. And then you're like, OK, I'm going to bring in some other people. I need this fleshed out. The audience was asking for answers. and so. Then you bring it, well, how would I find the answer to this? Let me go look up in a history book and let me say what I want to say to you based on what I would have found in a history book. I mean, Roger Ebert, his review was, this movie was ingenious. Mm -hmm. And I think it was. I think, like everyone else here, we all thought it was real. There were posters going out that these three hikers were missing. So I walked in and left that movie thinking, oh my gosh, two hours down the road, this, you know, these hikers are missing and I could be the next victim. Mm -hmm. um, was this intentional? that you wanted to make it feel like if it was a real thing? Well, I mean, I think that's what you get with Bloody Mary, right? I mean, even when you're six years old, you're like, Bloody Mary is really in the mirror. Bloody Mary is really going to kill you. You never, you never tell another six-year-old, it's all not a real story. This is playing on your fears. If you put it on the mirror in your head, you'll imagine it. You're never going to tell a story that way. So you want people to be terrified. You want them to believe this is true. So of course you're like, this really happened. And, and the first time I heard about it, um, IndieWire had come out. They hadn't even shot a single piece of footage yet. And Ed and Dan had come up with this videotape. And it said, this is a history of the township of Blair. And there was a zucchini festival. And they, had, they were trying to raise money. Yeah, and it, was like our, it was always like our investor tape, which kind of laid out the story, a little bit of the history, and then what happened to the three filmmakers and you know, that Hacks and Films, which is the company that we have uh, when we had at the time, um, was, was gotten, got the footage, the rights to the footage, and now we're editing it together. So. Yeah, it was, the, our whole thing was like trying to kind of recapture like the, the fear that Dan and I had while watching like In Search Of or like any kind of pseudo documentary like Legend of, the, of Boggy Creek, um, even Cherry of the Gods, like there's these, these um, films that, you know, j just the, the idea that, that it could be real for us was, uh, was kind of the thing that, that, that kind of uh, fueled us to come to figure out what, you know, the, Blair, the whole Blair Witch thing. Um, but yeah, we wanted it to feel real. We wanted nothing in the movie to fee to like um, to give up the fact that it was not real. Like we didn't want any like crazy special effects or crazy lighting or anything like that. We wanted it to be like totally 100 percent real. Yeah, you know, t to your question, there was definitely not an intention to make people think it was truly real. And I think the fact that it's very easy to, sh to prove that there was no township of Blair, <laughs> Maryland. So there were clearly fictional elements that you would not have done if you were trying to actually create a hoax in that sense. I think it was, it, it was definitely more like, let's, 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 talk, let's talk to the audience. Let's tell this story in a very realistic way. And, and that goes to when the footage came back from the shoot and Ed and Dan started assembling it, you know, I remember Ed was very much like, I'm just, I'm, we're just, we were, the plan was just for them, these guys to cut an assembly of the footage and, and just keep everything that felt authentic and real and get rid of anything that felt fake, any lines of dialogue that didn't work. So the first assembly of the film, which was, I don't know how long, yeah, it was like, just, was, was, was not an assembly to try to create a narrative or anything. It was just, let's just take what's good and what's real and then we'll work from there. I think what made it so effective was the found footage technique. I mean, it's not the first time it's ever been used, but I think the Blair Witch really made it very popular. Like, I mean, years later, Cloverfield and um, Paranormal Activity used the same thing, but it just didn't have the same kind of oomph like what the Blair Witch did, as I, you know, I thought it was real. I thought it was actually like a, a documentary, right. but I think using that technique, and, and I have to be, like, be honest, the marketing of the film really helped it, catapult it to where it is. Well, and I think there's, what's interesting is I think there's a lot of chances, and I think this is true of every film, for it to all go terribly wrong. And, and from the very beginning, it was supposed to be a little bit more fictional and feel. Where you were gonna, what became the curse of the Blair Witch. We're like, okay, we're gonna shoot this kind of narrative documentary sort of stuff. Oh, here's this part of the story, now we're gonna go to the found footage. Here's the story, now we're gonna go to the found footage. And then through the process, and it was a year, wasn't it, of editing? 
Yeah, it was a yeah, it was like not yeah. Nine it was like months. a year of editing, and it kept on coming back. It's less entertaining. It's less emotional. It's less scary whenever we bring in more things. And there was a big debate about it. And we had outsiders come in and look at it, other people who had really good taste. And you're like, I think that you're just going to have to have this plate straight because it's much more compelling. It's much scarier. And the fact that you're not really sure, like, once it feels more jazzed up more formal you're like okay now i've been removed from the story yeah it's harder to believe you know yeah. like yeah like because because the, the original idea for the movie was going to be a straight-up documentary about examining the footage um of these three filmmakers in the woods and then it was going to be more like curse of the blair witch was, ended up it was going to be more yeah it was i mean really it was like an in search of episode of, or documentary about yeah. this you know when and, did you uh, make the decision to make it what it is now probably towards the end of that year of editing yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it was we, a process. Well, we realized like a, we realized that the slow realization. Yeah, we realized that the, the the documentary stuff was getting in the way of the footage, you know. And every time we came out, we got out, came away from the kids, you know, the, the people in the in the woods. It not not that it was a bore, it was boring, but it kind of like pulled the tension out of the movie, you know. So we were like, let's just play the whole thing and just see what happens, you know. Well, but I think to your point about Cloverfield and Paranormal Activity. I think the one thing that's interesting, and I, you know, when, when we got invited to do this, I kind of thought, oh, I should, my kids hadn't seen anything related to Blair Witch before this. And so I thought, oh, I'll show them Curse of the Blair Witch. And I hadn't seen it, I think, since we, <laughs> since we made it. And um, as I was watching it, I thought, this is deeply weird for TV even today, uh -huh. much less in 1999. <laughs> and, I, and I remember thinking it was much more traditional and documentary style, but really, like, it starts off with no explanation and just, kind of dives in, and the film does that too. And I think the difference is, is that, you know, as, as Ed was saying, the film as it exists now was not intended to exist that way. So the found footage conceit wasn't meant to carry the entire film. And I think something happens where it feels, it feels very real because it's not, it doesn't work like a standard narrative mm -hmm. versus like those other movies where they're thinking of the entire film as found footage. So they're, they're hewing much closer to a traditional narrative arc. Now, the, th the three major players here are the actors. Um, when I was watching it the first time and I, when I rewatched it, um, watching it the first time I thought it was real. So now at least I know it, it isn't clearly. Um, did they play a key role? Was it which? was improv? Did you have to teach them how to use a camera? Which, were they really operating the camera? Yeah, we had like a little mini film camp for them, like a little film school, um, where we kind of showed them. We, we were using a, a high aid video camera, which is basically slap the tape in and, you know, and go to, you know, and start taping. We had to tell uh, Heather uh, after the first day of shooting, like, zoom, make sure you zoom out, because she was walking around with the camera zoomed in, and it was even shakier than than, uh, than the end, than the movie ended up. But it was just it was just too much. So there was like little things like that that we had to tell them. And then we were using a CP16 uh, uh, film camera, and we kind of taught Josh, who was supposed to be the cameraman, a little bit about that, how to you know run it and stuff. But um, but yeah, they you know they were they were actors, and and uh, you know so we had to kind of train them not only on you know the the equipment, but also on the mythology, like. You know, Heather was supposed to be an expert on the Blair Witch. So the mythology that we had built, we basically gave it to her to, to you know, exploit throughout the movie, to just how bring it, it up. How was the process of casting the actors? I mean, you had to pick completely unknowns. There's not, you know, you couldn't hire Gwyneth Paltrow or, you know, Brad Pitt to play the No, it, it wouldn't have worked. No, it couldn't, it couldn't have cast it. And didn't have the money. <laughs> no, it wouldn't have worked. For um, a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, no, we just, we went to New York mostly. Um, uh, we auditioned here. We auditioned in L.A. We auditioned in Orlando where we were based. But um, New York, you know, the, the New York is, talent is where, like, the, just the, the, the unsigned talent is, that's where, where really where, where, the, where it's concentrated. So we auditioned about 1,000 people. Um, and we were just looking for like really like good people, people who could really improv well and like really feel like like you were really like they were a lot like they were real, you know. Like that's the whole thing. Like just do these people sound like they're saying lines or are they you know really just talking? And we didn't write any dialogue in the movie in the script, so we knew it was going to be improvised. So we just picked the we just picked the right a actors, really. You and know? the best the best part of that story was you know they immediately walked into a, a fictional moment, so you, they. The, Heather walked into the, I think it was a prison guard thing, so as you went into the elevator, it said, this is the, what panel was it? it was, 
I can't, I can't, so it was it was like your oh parole probation board parole. Oh, 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 right, right, they right, go right, in right. and they're like why should you you committed this murder you've shown no remorse please explain why we should let you back out to the general population and there's no warning right you're just walking into an improv moment and and she was like well you shouldn't let me out yeah like, yeah oh. no I mean that, that's the thing it's like you really found out exactly who was good and who was not so good at improv in, in the auditions but we just throw as many curveballs at them as possible and switch the situations up and just see what they came up with um, let's talk about the story itself mm -hmm. I was talking about you know it's probably the most legendary ghost story in cinema right now. What was the process of creating the story? How did it, you know, it, did it evolve from a basic ghost story to a fa documentary almost? Well, I feel like, I mean, so it's a, it's, it ends up being a multi-stage process because you start off with what compels you, right? So Dan and Ed were like, their first issue was, what will you believe that you can see that that we can justify spending no money on the camera work because the, the fatal flaw in all student films is the camera work is terrible. And so you're like, so how can you make that weakness a strength? So they went out there and they're like, it's going to be the Blair Witch, we're going to give this backstory. And then once we started editing it and it came out on, this is what we're talking about the other day, split screen. Yeah. Then split screen people were like, what is this story? Is this a true story? You have to tell me more about it. And John Pearson, who really gave Blair its original break, um, metered on split screen, opened up his bulletin board system, which was supposed to be about independent film. And then everybody was like, I need to know more about this witch. What is this thing about Burgettsville? Do you have the footage? We want to know more. And then we had to launch a website. And then the website had to develop answers to all these questions that everybody But this had. was 1999. I mean, there was And it was no a year before, before the movie came out. Yeah. No, there was nothing. So it was before the film yeah. was even edited. So yeah. I'm like, do you think a movie like this would be as successful as it was in 1999? in the world of you know, Twitter and Facebook when you know, it, in a 10 minute period, people could say that, oh, this is not real. There's no, there's no real Blair Witch out there. I think yes, There's no missing thing. hikers. It, it, it can be. It, I mean, the whole is it real, is it not real angle would not fly at all. But I think we still see that people want to play along with great stories, in particular, great ghost stories. So I think it could be done. It wouldn't be done the same way and I think the story wouldn't be necessarily told the same way, but absolutely. Like when you look at internet myths like Slender Man, I think that's an example of people participating in a, in a new kind of ghost story mythology um, um, in very interesting ways, in very similar ways that people did originally around Blair Witch, particularly in that period of time between the website launching and the movie premiering at Sundance, and then that, you know, from Sundance to when it premiered in cinemas, which was practically a full year. I mean, USA Today said this is probably the first movie that ever went viral. Right. Uh, especially how technology was in 1999 and 19, or 1998 and 1999 compared to what it is now. Right. So how do you, how do you feel how the, the viewers or the audience reacted after watching it? You're gonna have to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> about, about going viral? Yes, or like the response that you got from the audience after they saw this movie. Well, I don't know, for me, I suspect we'll have different answers because we got the, 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 the I, I have a very different, like, like I think to a lot of people, particularly in Hollywood, Blair Witch came out of nowhere, right? And just, and they didn't, it didn't get on their radar until maybe Sundance. But for us, by the time we were at Sundance, right, like I remember distinctly, it was a midnight screening, the premiere, and we were there a couple of times before because I worked at a film festival, and uh, so I knew the environment. And we're standing there at that midnight screening, and the, the, if you've ever been, there's like, the film had sold out before the festival started, and they, you do a standby line, and it was midnight, and the film was screening in, 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 in Salt Lake City later that week, and that screening hadn't sold out, but the standby line to see it at midnight at the premiere. What's a standby packed. line, just in case? The standby line is like the film sold out, um, but there's pass holders, so they sell standby lines. You get in line, and you get a number, and then and if, the if, somebody, if the if certain somebody, badge holders don't show up and there's yeah. 15 or 20 seats open, they let 15 or 20 people in, which would be a large number uh, of people to get let in. Well, well there were like, I don't know, like 100 a lot. people, there's a lot and, they were, and they were students. They were college students, they were high school kids who you never see come up, up, up the mountain to the festival. Do you and think they, that helped spread the word? Well, we knew, we knew that was from the word of mouth that had been going on for like six months before we got to Sundance. I mean, I even 
was, we were talking there and we said, look, if we don't get a deal that we like, we can four wall this. So I remember yeah. telling you, I said, we can four wall the theaters and make our, our, our investors money back just because we've already built an audience. But nobody, nobody, none of the distributors walking in really understood. And when Artisan bought the film, they actually, the, the, they said that there was a split in the company with the older executives going, we don't get it. And all the younger executives going, you, we have to buy this film because they had been following it on the website. And, um, and the, the, one of the co-presidents said that the, what sent him over the line and decided to buy it was actually he noticed that split. And when he saw the split, the age split, he realized that something was happening that he just hadn't seen and, and went with it. Well, and I think to, to speak to what Mike said a little bit earlier, uh, I don't know if anybody has kids that do Minecraft. And there's, Probably is. there's a ghost story. Do you know this ghost story in Minecraft? Who is that guy again the, with the eye? Oh, no, I don't know that one. Well, um. so, so it's this myth that, that the coder had put a secret evil inside Minecraft and there's, oh, I wish I could remember his name, but all of my son's friends knew about it. And then it became an excuse of, I didn't blow up your world, that evil ghost blew up your world. And because of my history, my son's world got blown up. Oh, I don't know who blew up your son's village. It wasn't me, it was, I saw, I saw this evil character that's in the code. So I sat them down. And I'm like, let me explain to you how a viral myth starts <laughs> and how you cannot use a viral myth on me to lie about blowing up my child's <laughs> village. But looking at that again, like in some ways I'm like, oh, you can't do this again because the audience is too savvy. But my, my son's not too savvy. He's like, I think maybe this evil ghost inside Minecraft actually did it. And I'm like, no. You want to believe that. Right. Everybody else has picked it up. Every 12-year-old boy is like, this is true. I've seen it. I'm going to perpetuate the myth. I have witnessed it. Yes. My story is also a true story. So I think we, we're constantly doing this to ourselves. Were you guys ready of the tsunami that happened when the movie <laughs> came out? I, mean, I remember watching the cast on The Tonight Show, and they were all kind of like deer in the headlights of what was happening. How did you guys react to it? Um, it was, uh, you know, it was just like a crazy ride, and it was, uh, it was like uh, one thing after another, and uh, you, we kind of became like a little bit desensitized to it. And I think that the fact that we were, um, you know, there was five of us in the company, and then there was other people all around us that had, you know, we had really built this movie up as a community. Um, I think that was the reason that nobody kind of lost themselves and like went off and to LA and like became, you know. Uh, you know, this crazy, you know, Hollywood person, you know, like we all kind of, there was so much temptation, so much like craziness going on, like things that we never imagined were ever going to happen to us were happening and then one right after the other, you know, and, uh, but it was, and it was actually got to the point where it was kind of scary because after, you know, Dan and I were like, well, we're going to, we're going to have to make another movie after this. And whatever we do, no matter what the hell we do, this is, it's never going to compare to this. So, we, I remember one, uh, Dan and I sitting in like, um, it was in Canada somewhere, we were in the middle of the press tour and it was like, you know, just question after question. But for us, it was like, we love talking about, nobody's asked us about a movie ever, you know, this much. So we were really into it, but, and we were enjoying it and we were, but, and we were just sitting there doing a break and we were like just sitting there, you know, in this cafe somewhere and, and we were like, man, this is never going to happen to us again. <laughs> you know, we have to like enjoy it. And we were like, yeah, absolutely, this is never going to happen again. This is like a miracle, and we just have to kind of ride the wave and, and, and see where it takes us and not take ourselves too seriously. 20 years later, or almost 20 years later, how do you guys look back at this? I still think it's an amazing phenomenon. I think what I have been talking about today, coming through the Library of Congress and looking up the paraphernalia and remembering uh, some of the interesting things that that I got into at the time was, I'm like, oh, I'll go to the land records. I'll write down the land records for Blair Witch. I'll, I'll help fabricate this part of the story. And we had lots of conversation about true fakeness and fake, this is a fake, fake document. This is a true fake document. And this is a true document that's unrelated to the story at all that we've used to bring in some credibility. And because of that experience on that, I've, I've continued to be, oh, Bigfoot could be real. Here's a fake document. A Here's monster. a true fake, the Loch Ness Monster. And then today, when I see things like, you know, just in the modern age, you're like, is this a true story? I need to look at the source material yeah. because I know from my experience, I'll say, here's a piece of source material. I've linked it. It proves that the Blair Witch is real. But if you click on it, 
and you actually read it, it doesn't really do what I've said it does, but, but you'll tend not to look at it. You're like, oh, for instance, Maryland Historical Society for years had people call up and say, I need this book that's The Cult of the Blair Witch. Uh -huh. It was published in 1870. There's one copy. You have it because it says it on this website. And they're like, it doesn't exist. And they're like, so you won't show it to us. And they're like, no, no, it doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. There's no such book. And they're like, well, you had it. And now, and so we put on, it's in a private collection. So people would leave the poor Maryland Historical Society. They, st they still won't show it to us. They, still, they still won't show it to us. I don't and know. then, you know, so it's just a cover. And there's some stuff that we fabricated for inside it. But um, I think as I was fabricating more documents, then I would look for the documents that I fabricated because I'd reference them very well. I wanted it to look accurate. Like, here's the Dewey Decimal note, here's the code. And I'm like, this isn't here. Oh, because I made that up. <laughs> and and the, there's a, a book, The Thirteenth Warrior, where he was like, the true story of Beowulf, there was uh, an Arabian man that joined the Vikings to uh -huh. kill Beowulf. And he had references in the back of his book. And he had the same problem. I, I remember feeling sympathy with him. I'm like, I know. He's like, I spent months. I know that this is what inspired me to write this. Oh, no, that's fake. I faked that. Oh, it's not there. And so just today, I was looking at these old notes, and I said, um, oh, look at this interesting thing that I had come up with. I'm going to Google myself to see what else I did. And then there was somebody that was saying, oh, this, is, this cult of the Blair Witch book isn't true, but here's 10 true things. A very obscure website, top, like, you know, I don't know, factsoftheworld.com, something very strange. And I'm like, oh, look at these true stories. I instantly believed they were true. This is my business. You can say anything. Somebody needs to make money selling the top 10 things. I have no idea if the first one that they said was a true Maryland witch story. But I believe it because it came from the most obscure, Wh least referenced place ever. And I'm yeah. like, well, you said I was a lie, which I know I'm a lie, so you must be which, the truth which, teller. Which actually goes back to the question you asked about if you could do this again uh -huh. today. I actually think that we probably went way deeper in fabricating the narrative for the myth for Blair Witch than most fake news sites do to fabricate the slight evidence oh, that they use <laughs> that people willingly believe yeah. now. There's actually, I think, less need to prove something's true. It was today. the 1998 version of fake news, I guess, right? I mean, yeah. it actually really is interesting. I, I never thought this would be so salient on a national stage, but in the last year, there, there are certain things that you did. And you can't make a good ghost story if people don't want to believe. Like, X-Files is true. You want to believe in UFOs, you look for reasons to believe. Trust me, if my name Roswell, I know the exact <laughs> how that works. But so, you, you can't have this success if people don't want the success to come. So if I tried to sell you a story on caterpillars, you're not going to do the work to search out that information. You're like, I just don't care. But we want which stories to be true. We've heard them when we were young. You, when you stumble across it in a certain way, the more obscure it is, the more you feel like, I finally found the real one. I thought it was out there. I know that this town is nearby. You don't investigate. We had even private investigators who were like, I've always wanted to investigate a witch story. They really did. And so they spent three weeks trying to figure out how they could help us find these three students. And finally called us up and like, I'm having a lot of problems tracking the information. Now, but part of it's because they wanted to believe the story was true. And so if you have a story, and it doesn't matter if it's more of a factual story or a mythological story. You're like, I want to believe my worldview is true. I want to believe this person is horrible or this person is great. And this obscure site said that this thing was true. And they're saying nobody's reporting it because you don't want to hear the truth. Yeah. The Maryland Historical it, Society doesn't want to show they're it. They're hiding it. They're hiding yeah. it. I mean, the thing is, is that, is that when it comes to ghost stories in particular, I think it's human nature to want to believe that there are forces at play in the world that are affecting our lives that we have no control over. Or it's beyond human capital. Yes. And, and that is, that's just a simple fact of human nature. So, you know, and you're crafting a, a myth that essentially plays on that. It's, you know, and then on top of that, like what Ed was saying is that, you know, when cutting the film together, it was always like, you can never give a piece, every piece of information can suggest one or another, but it can never definitively say it's something supernatural or it's something that's, you know, human. And so when you're be playing that balance the whole time, you're basically feeding the evidence for whoever, whatever story the, the viewer wants to, to believe. Yeah. Before we take questions from the audience, um, let's do a little quick, uh, where are they now? Um, could you tell us where are the cast members now and what projects all three of you guys are working on now? Ooh. 
We'll start with Ed. The, the cast, um, uh, Mike Williams is a, 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 a high school counselor now. Um, he got out of business probably like 10 years ago. I mean, the last time we saw him, he was facing the wall. Yes, exactly. And he still acts, but he is a, a happy guy just, you know, doing the, the high school counselor thing. And then um, Joshua is still acting. He's still directing. He does a lot of uh, TV stuff, uh, a lot of TV work. He was on uh, Bates Motel, which I just, yeah. we just watched uh, recently. Um, and then Heather is, was in the business for a while, and then she, she went off and grew pot for a while. Um, and now, I'm not sure where Heather is. Uh, she kind of goes on and, off, on and off on Facebook, and uh, kind of is, she's just kind of out there DM. doing her own thing, you know? She might be in Colorado, anyway. Um, yeah. What projects are you working on? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly on, I'm working on TV right now, um, just directing TV shows. Um, and developing features, and um, uh, still trying to make features, but the, the indie feature world is, is very difficult right now. So just uh, moving forward on TV and trying to get our own TV show on the air. Before um, Mike answers, I should say that when this movie came out, I think it gave a little big boost for independent filmmakers or uh, student filmmakers. Absolutely, and, and, and that's what I think is like, for me, it's like the thing I'm most proud of because like when I was young, there was these movies and there was these filmmakers that were like really inspired me. And the fact uh, that you know, there's some people out there who um, just went out and, and, and tried to do it because of us, because we really did prove that anybody, you know, these, these completely unknown people with the right idea and a little bit of luck, actually a lot of luck, can do something that kind of you know, has this kind of impact. So I think we definitely inspired people just the way I was inspired by Clerks and El Mariachi and, you know, she's, and she's got to have it, you know, be, before that. I, I, I love the fact that Blair Witch still inspires people. How about you, Mike? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I really loved the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, taking this mythology that was really built for the, town, the actors to improvise from and, and as we release it online and see how audiences kind of took it and, and, and the way that we were essentially improvising the story with them in that sense, improvising by the, the way it was released and how we decided to kind of, what we decided to flesh out and what we decided to hold back. Um, I, I, I wanted to do more of that. And um, it was still early days. Hollywood, even after Blair Witch, was still like, uh, you know, that's marketing. We're not gonna fund anything online. And, um, and so I started actually a, a, a marketing agency called Campfire. And we work with uh, uh, entertainment brands, do a lot of work with HBO, um, Netflix, Amazon. And um, we essentially do a lot of what we were doing with Blair Witch, which is to help them build out their, the worlds of their shows um, online and in other forms of media. So we continue to do that. We like recently did a whole experiential thing at New York Comic Con for Westworld. So I love it. It's like we basically kind of create these experiences that go beyond the, 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 the original property. Excellent. How about you, Julia? Well, from the Blair stuff, I did a bunch of research for, we researched for In Search Of, and then we had to do this whole elaborate backstory for Hellboy with the Lance of Longinus. So from that, I got to do these great research projects into really obscure kind of paranormal sort of things. But since then, I've, I've been script writing for science fiction and horror. I had a movie come out called Alien Raiders. They have another one coming out from Bonaventura Pictures uh, called Higher Power, and I just finished one for STX, which we'll see if it goes about. It's like a cow version of Godzilla. You wow. know, Godzilla's comeuppance for the nuclear holocaust, <laughs> and GMO comeuppance is coming, and the cows will <laughs> ah, get their revenge. <laughs> so I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. If anybody has one, we'll start with you, sir. We have a microphone coming in your direction. Very interested in uh, kind of the blended media movement that's kind of been going in the past couple years. Blended media meaning both film and interactive media, such as computer games, that can be blended together to perhaps tell a story if you're doing a fictional film, but also looking at personally myself how you would design blended media that is nonfiction. And in particular, if you have a nonfiction genre that has lots of elements of horror, meaning it, it attacks someone, it, it attacks the viewer or the consumer in a way 
that they feel very scared. Um, have you any experiences first with uh, computer games in, in either sort of the Blair Witch kind of phenomenon or any suggestions on how to blend a computer game and some other movie that's being presented as nonfiction? I think it's a good mic question. Um, I I would look at uh, the National Film Board of Canada. They um, have been funding for years now a lot of kind of interactive documentary work, and uh, it's all available on their website. There's an enormous amount of it, and, and, and some of it is quite excellent uh, in terms of like just thinking about how to convey those stories. As for video games, I mean, not, there, were three, there were three video games that actually came out as part of Blair Witch, but they were, they were really largely done by uh, the game company. I mean, the stories were kind of pulled from the, the, mythology. the, the mythology, but. Didn't you do some multimedia, anything with horror, where you're like, it's, it's collaborative kind of horror? There have been, but you know, like in terms of, of like tapping into things that are real, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a tall order when you start to do that, because you know, you're dealing with real people, real people's stories. So I think it's a, I think there's a lot more ethical issues around it than maybe with fiction narrative. You brought up the, the video games. I never got a chance to ask you guys, what did you think of, of the sequels that came out for the original Blair Witch? <laughs> we'll start with that. Um, this, the, the, the first sequel was, um, you know, it was a weird time. We had just finished the mo the movie, and they were artists in the company that bought Blair Witch. Was like, we got to do a sequel right away. We're gonna release it next next um, Halloween. And um, did you guys have any input on it? Well, we we had input on it until we told them that we didn't like what they were doing, and then they kind of uh, didn't pay attention to us anymore. So the, the the first sequel was a little bit. It was really rushed, and it wasn't quite the right idea. And it's, I, don't, I don't think it's a terrible film, but I don't think it has... It's like a cousin of Blair Witch. It doesn't really belong in our mythology. And then the second sequel that came out last year, um, I think that one ties in much better to the original mythology. And, I, kind of and I, enjoy, I enjoyed that one a lot more, yeah. How about you? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think how to answer this and not uh, in the most politically... Uh, well, you're in the right um, I, I think I, I think the second film was made by people who were looking to push out a film, who were thinking about a brand called Blair Witch rather than the film or the fans. Um, and I think the film reflects that. I think that, um, I, I, you know, I think that it was, it, and, and I think that's that's the studio. I think the filmmaker wanted to tell a completely different story and wasn't necessarily interested in, in the Blair Witch story, and so took it in a direction there. So I really think it's, I wouldn't even call it a cousin. I would say it's really somebody else's idea of, of the social, sociological impact of Blair Witch and wanting to make a commentary on it and doing it under the name of Blair Witch. Um, I think I actually just recently saw the other sequel, which was fun, but uh, uh, it was fun. It, it felt like a, a, a reboot, right? Because it was hitting a lot of the same beats in that sense. Um, but I, what I really think, for me, what's most sad is that about the sequels is that um, I feel like the Blair Witch franchise right now is in the hands of people who, who still don't respect, I think, what Ed and Dan brought to it. And I think that there's definitely some thought, thinking, and care around it. And I think that um, the original ideas for how a franchise would actually roll out were, in my opinion, infinitely more interesting and more commercial than what, what has come out to date. But I, just, I don't think we'll ever see those, those films, unfortunately. Julia, for the person who helped build the history. <laughs> build the story. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, is I think that within the the core group, so you have like the five and then you have an additional seven and then it gets to 20. And yeah. I, th I don't think that even internally we all would agree on, oh, this is what I like the most about. And this. I, I think Ed and I even have different views of what's happening in the woods. You know, I have a whole, oh, the Native Americans and there's a specific incident that happened and it's the evil that was there the whole time and I have a whole story in my head. And that's the story I want in the sequel and, in the, and I don't think that they would do that one and I think Ed might do something a little different than Dan. So it's, it's hard to, 
it's hard to pass judgment on anything. So you think it's like, never going to be like a like Friday the 13th, mine 12 or happen. something, right? <laughs> like at the Blair Witch 15. I don't know. I mean, I actually think that there's, I think there's a specific space that Blair could continue. Um, I don't think that it's the space that they're following. I don't think it's a, a narrative type. It's not a traditional story. I think that if we went back into this more well, audience well, on collaboration. On a very basic sort of level, thing. right? If you follow the mythology, you actually can't have a sequel until 2034. Right? Exactly. 2034. 20, so stay tuned so, for 2034. 20, <laughs> so <laughs> technically, right, there can't be a sequel. I think the only movies you can make are the ones that go backwards, in my opinion. That's and just, then in 2034, it's yeah. going to have to be somebody with their own camera and it's not. Their own gonna, iPhone or their own yeah. smartphone. Exactly. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Their own virtual reality. Yeah, it'll be like a holographic <laughs> experience or something. You know? We'll do one more question. I see the gentleman there in the middle. There seems to be an insatiable appetite for really gross out gore in horror films like Walking Dead. And in contradistinction to your film, which was about the imagination, which can be far more terrifying than seeing people's entrails, you know, pouring out on the screen. So why do, why do you think uh, today we, we're so fascinated by zombies and so forth, and do you think it's an excessive amount of violence uh, being perpetrated on the screen? Well, I agree with that one. I think that there's, and I actually think a lot of it is just, it's, it's easy, and including in script writing, right? It's easy to say and then their head gets chopped off, right? And if you're gonna say it was really, ter the person was terrified of dying, that's much more complicated to do correctly. You're, instead, you're just like, I'm bored. I'm not, I don't feel this emotion that you're feeling. But if you chop the head off, you're like, I showed you somebody with their head chopped off, and now you should feel something because an event happened. So I, I think probably a lot of the reasons in movies you see clear-cut, awful things happen is because that's it's easier to pull off. You know what the beats are, and, and then the beats go that way. And also, I will say that when you get to the machine of Hollywood, and I know both of these guys have experienced that, you go into a room and you're like, okay, here's my story, and you don't know what's happening. And they're like, well, you have to know what's happening because I'm the executive, so you have to explain it to me. And you're like, well, okay, let me explain the backstory to you. So I've always agreed with Ed, like, they did the story right because as a ghost story, you come in, you're like, Bloody Mary's going to show up in the mirror. And then you don't say, and here is a novel to read to explain to you the history of why she would show up in a mirror. And now you're not scared anymore. You're like, I know this will happen. This is where the person, and you don't need a lot of explanation. But in film studios, you need a lot of explanation. And then you're like, okay, and then they killed this person, and they killed this person, and all this stuff. And then suddenly everything becomes a lot more literalized and a lot more explained. And and then it's not scary anymore, and then sometimes it's just, well, we'll just do the brutal version because there's specific people that like the brutal part of the film, so we'll just make the whole film. It's easy. Well, I, yeah, brutal. and I, I mean, I think, you know, horror, it's kind of like comedies, you know, there's really intelligent satires, and then there's gross out comedies. And I think horror is like that, and I think those, the films with a lot of gore are, are, are kind of about a different emotional state. They're more like, a, I think, a, a theme park ride. And, um, and I think then, this, whereas the more psychological horror films are really about try, kind of shaking you to your core. And sometimes you get a, a mixture of both in something like The Exorcist where it's, it's pretty explicit, but at the same time it also hits you deeply inside. But um, um, that's a hard, it's hard, hard to balance it. And, and, and it's, you know, to Julie's point, it's a lot easier to see the commercial appeal of the theme park ride than it is the psychological horror because uh, the, those commercial aspects are easy to market, whereas with the more psychological stuff, if the critics don't like it, it kind of becomes a hard sell. Yeah, and it becomes like a, the search for like trailer moments, yeah. you know, and you have like, when it's a real subtle movie that doesn't have, you know, it could be really scary or whatever, but doesn't have the, the trailer, you know, thing exploding or somebody coming at the camera or whatever, it's just hard to market, you know? But I mean, you know, for, for our film, I mean, I, you know, I think Dan and I were definitely fans of like, you know, the kind of the psychological stuff, but also, you know, what our film, you know, the, 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 big, the big reason why, why nothing happened really uh, crazy or, or, or gory or anything in our film, I think a lot of it had to do that we had no money. Because, yeah, um, you know, everybody's past, you know, everybody asked like, well, you know, what was the original ending going to be and this and that. And 
I think that if we'd, ha if we'd had some money and we had some resources, we would have done something a little bigger in the end. I mean, I, maybe we would have well, gone back to the original ending, we, but- We but, did shoot yeah, yeah, the, there was, door. Yeah, yeah, because we, because that ending for us work. was like the hardest thing to find, you know, to not betray the rest of the movie. But a lot of it was just like, we can't, um, we can't afford to have, like Julia said, we can't afford to have a dismemberment. You know, we don't have the budget to like really do it right. Um, <laughs> But I think if we would have had, you know, unfortunately, I think if we would have had the resources, I think, you know, we would have added something in there. I don't know if it would have worked, but I think it's just, like it's like Spielberg and the shark not working in Jaws, except yeah, like yeah. a lot fewer zeros. Yes. On the budget. Like nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, <laughs> I think that's so you know, a lot of it, like just the creativity of just, yeah. you know, coming up with something where you don't have you have very limited resources, you know, so. Well, and I would say, but there's two things again, it's it's. You actually, tr like Jaws, you triumph when you're doing less with limited resources, but we had a lot of things where we're seeing other people do stuff and you're like, if you have, a, if you have an 18 year old giving an interview, they're clearly not a reporter. We don't have the budget to hire somebody who is gonna play a reporter well. We don't have the budget to make the soundstage look correct, so we're just not gonna have that scene. And so part of doing things right is knowing that you're going to do it badly and so just don't do it. You're not allowed yeah, to have it's that Yeah, no, it's scene. knowing your limitations, that you're not going to be able to pull that off at that budget level and you just kind of find another way to keep the I audience. Mean, I would say 90% of people, just if you're going to be in a low budget film or 90% of people make that mistake. They're like, well, I'm going to have high ambition and I'm going to, I'm going to show you all that I can, you know, do something for $20 that takes you $20 million. And if you're just slightly off the mark, then the whole movie fails. And you're like, yeah. man, you almost pulled it off. And now you fail more spectacularly and you have nothing to work with, which is unfortunate. Well, I appreciate all of you being here tonight. Um, on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, we welcome you here, of Thanks course. Thanks for having us. I appreciate Thank this you. so much. Oh, so I know, oh, what? We have a little present for you. Oh, well, this we love is presents. This original Sundance poster from 1999. Wow. Can we, and we'd like we to unfold it? To the Library it? of Congress. Yeah. We would love to, you know. You could have it at your display. I was about to say, we could add it to our Halloween pop-up exhibit. I'm doing it backwards, sorry. I'm very anticlimactic here. Uh, wow, this is mint great. condition. It is. <laughs> Thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you again to Ed, Mike, and Julia. So, for all of you who haven't seen The Blair Witch, project. I hope you enjoy it. For all of you who are going to rewatch it, get ready to be scared all over again. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.